Welcome everybody, a softer voice, a softer tone. Welcome to uh, PRIO and today's seminar on uh, Afghan education with His Excellency Minister Farouk Warda. My name is uh, Christian Berghardt Wicken. I am the director of uh, PRIO. It is uh, indeed a great pleasure to have uh, Minister Wardak here. He is uh, an old friend. We were working in the same street in Peshawar back in the very beginning of the 1990s. We first met, I believe, in February 1990. Uh, at that time, he uh, was uh, already uh, an accomplished uh, uh, health expert working for the Swedish Committee for Afghan Afghanistan a committee with which uh, I had a lot to do working in a uh, uh, sister organization at the time, the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee. Since then, uh, I've had the pleasure of linking up with uh, Farouk Wardak on a number of occasions. We've, uh, for various reasons, had uh, interests in common. I kept in touch with him later in the 1990s when he was working for the UNDP in a very innovative community-based rehabilitation program for landmine victims and other disabled people in Afghanistan. After 2001, he uh, uh, came to Kabul and has held uh, such a number of important positions in uh, the administration, but all, not only in the administration, but in fact in various functions preparing for uh, uh, Afghanistan's uh, new constitution at the very outset after 2001. He has held instrumental roles in preparing for the uh, Afghan-Pakistani uh, peace jirga. He uh, is currently uh, closely affiliated with the uh, High Peace Council, which is instrumental in the, uh, in the uh, underlying work for the talks between the government and uh, uh, the Taliban. But he has also held several ministerial functions. He has been uh, and the titles are very long, I have to say, Your Excellency, so I have to read them out. But amongst other uh, minister posts, you have been a Minister of State for Parliamentary Affairs. Not an unimportant function in a newly formed democracy where the liaison function between the Parliament and the government is of utmost importance. And uh, since uh, October 2008, he has been a Minister of uh, Education. Also, as I'm sure all of you realize, a very important post. So to the title of today's talk is Challenges of the Education System of Afghanistan. It's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Your Excellency, the Minister, here. We will uh, have the Minister talk for uh, up to half an hour uh, and then we have only one hour uh, this afternoon. So uh, after that we will directly open up for questions and answers and I do expect you, of course, to prepare sharp, pointed, critical and constructive <laughs> questions as the Minister speaks. Your Excellency, the floor you. is yours. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellencies, my distinguished colleagues, ex-colleagues and current colleagues, our ambassador, educationalists, humanist and ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor for me to address this prestigious Peace and Research Institute of Oslo and have the opportunity to interact with you about the challenges of education development in Afghanistan during the post-transition period. I am equally thankful to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Royal Norwegian Government for organizing my visit to your lovely country and to Mr. Christian Burke for organizing today's gathering on such a pertinent topic. It is my privilege to represent the aspiration of millions of children and youth from a country which is in transition from war and turbulence to prosperity. Excellencies, the development of education in my country is one of the most successful legacy of the world partnership in Afghanistan and one of the most successful stories of the past 10 years. We have been able to transform a disabled and dysfunctioning education system of 2001, which was providing poor quality education 
to less than 1 million boys only, through less than 20,000 male teachers only, and 3,400 schools, none of which was having its own building, and at the time that there was no national unified standard curriculum. To a responsive, inclusive, and progressive system of today that it provide education to over 9 million children, 40% of which are girls, by 200,000 teachers, 32% of which are women, and 15,600 schools, at least 50% of which is having their own building. This is at the time that there is a standard and national curriculum applicable everywhere in Afghanistan. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge with gratitude the fact that without the generous support of our friends and the international community, particularly in Norway, we would not have been able to even think of this transformation, not to speak about achieving it. I would like to exp express my special thanks to the Norwegian public, successive Norwegian government, and not to forget the heroic Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, Norwegian Church Aid, Norwegian Refugee Council, and maybe other Norwegian organization who played a key role in the establishment of the foundation of the current education system of my country. These Norwegian NGOs, in addition to providing rehabilitation services to thousands of Afghan girls, boys, men, women, and other disenfranchised people in the most remote, remote areas of Afghanistan. They have also invested in young Afghan by providing jobs and learning opportunity to hundreds of educated Afghan who would have otherwise migrated to Europe and America. To that extent, they have helped in preventing brain drain of those who now play a key role in the various government institutions. Distinguished colleagues, today education is more important than ever, not for its role in nation building, but also for its impact on regional and global stability, growth, and prosperity. Let me offer a synopsis of development in the past 10 years and the current and future challenges <laughs> based on the ground realities I will also touch upon the lesson learned and our way forward. Ten years back, honorable colleagues, we literally stood on the brink of a complete collapse of the public education system in Afghanistan with shrinking enrollment and virtual exclusion of girls from school. In contrast, today girls account for 40% of the total of enrollment of 9 million students. Notwithstanding the achievement we have had, we have not lost sight of the enormous challenges those are lying still ahead of us. And some of them I'll mention here. First, about 4 million of school-age children and youth, majority of them are girls and disadvantaged group in the hard to reach and insecure part of Afghanistan, do not have access to education. This represents 34% of the total school age population of Afghanistan. And this represents 6.6% of the entire world out of school children. Severe shortage of school and teacher leading to poor access and low quality of education. Even among the existing schools, around 50% of them do not have their own building. Only 40%, 40. 40 40% of our teacher possess the minimum required qualification for a teacher. Over 9 million adults between age 15 and 45, which count for 30% of our population, they lack literacy and occupational skill. Only 2% of our 9th grade graduate find their way to technical and vocational education. As a result, there is a huge mismatch between the available skill and those required by the labor market leading to high unemployment rate of 
our future challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, eight years from now, the year 2020 will be the important milestone for Afghanistan. This is Afghanistan deadline for achieving the Millennium Development Goal 2. In other words, universal primary education completion and education for all goal. In order to achieve universal primary education by year 2020, we need to achieve 100% of the enrollment in grade one by 2014, because they have to study for six years to complete the primary education. And put in place additional measure to bring school dropout to zero and or provide them with alternative education. This is not an easy task, but let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, this is not impossible either. Given our dual responsibility of re rebuilding and reforming the education sector in Afghanistan, several new challenges will add on to the current ones, especially in the light of ongoing transition, which may not be easy to handle. In order to accommodate 15 million students by year 2020, by year 2020, we anticipate the population of Afghanistan will be 44 million, out of which 15 million will be of the school age. Now, to accommodate all 15 million, which is compulsory by our, by our constitution, we would require over 10,000 new school in the total of 375,000 teachers. Similarly, in order to provide school with their own buildings, we would have to construct 16,000 new schools. Why is that clear? Today, I have 200,000 teachers, but the total number that will be required for in 2020 to how to use the ratio of one teacher for 40 students. I'm not comparing myself with Norway or any other European country, even with Iran, which has one teacher for 12 students. I am just comparing myself with my own history. In the time of Daud Khan, for every 40 student, there was a teacher. So taking that ratio of teacher and student into account, for 40 students, if there is one teacher, for 15 million, I will, have, I will need 375,000 teachers. Today, I have 200,000 only. And today, 6,000 of my current schools, they do not have building. I will need to establish additional 10,000 schools. So altogether, 16,000 schools will require their own buildings. Now, colleagues, I'll speak about some of the opportunities and way forward. Everywhere there are not challenges. There are some bright <coughs> spots which we will maximize and we will use and we will be able to overcome, if not all of the problems, at least some of the problems. We realize the enormity of these challenges, honorable colleagues, but we are equally aware of the opportunities before us to succeed in our mission. Here are a few of them that make us confident and provide us with basic foundation to build upon. First, the constitutional obligation of providing free and compulsory primary education. That is our primary strength. The political will and support to realize this goal from the President of Afghanistan, who is the strongest advocate for education. For the last four years, Steadily, the budget, the ordinary budget of, of education has been increased by an average of 32%. By virtue of its recognition as a national priority, the school education and literacy sector receive 15% of the national budget, which is next only to defense and the internal security. There is an increasing public awareness and demand for education, which is duly supported by the community ownership, which, without which no social program can succeed. My respected colleagues, one thing that we have learned from working with the international people, that no developmental intervention will be sustainable unless and until it is owned by the local people. The good news that I am going to share with you today, we have been able to create a demand for education. We have been able to to make education achieve its ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of education is to change the attitude and behavior of people toward positive, to change the attitude of people to demand education. 
If this is the farmer, if this is the shooter, if this is the government employee, if this is the talib, if this is an insurgent, all of them want education. So that we can say that education has worked. And why I can claim that? Because it has created a demand. Communities have been empowered to the point that they have taken ownership of education and have come to the forefront of expanding and defending the fundamental right of education for their children. It has been through the communities that we persuaded some of the insurgent to make peace with education and allow over 500 schools which were located in the insecure area and they remained closed for three or four years, now they have been reopened. Through the communities, we succeeded in establishing a single classroom community-based schools for one million children, 60% of them are girls in the remote areas. Through the communities, we hope to undertake innovative initiatives that will connect mask-based education, home-based education, accelerated learning with a formal education. Our new approaches, with a, way, with a view to reinforcing and strengthening the ongoing developmental and exponential growth of our education system, the following new approaches will form part of our core strategies to achieve the Millennium Development Goal and Education for All Goal. Number one, membership of the Global Partnership for Education, GPE. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most encouraging development has been Afghanistan entry into the Global Partnership for Education in March last year. My colleagues, it was not in easy precondition. I'm pretty sure you know all, previously it was called Fast Track Initiative. Now it is called Global Partnership for Education. The precondition for that is a country which has commitment to, to meet the education for all goal, number one. Number second, only commitment is not enough. They have robust planning to, to achieve their commitment. Third, they must have institutionalized capacity to implement the plan. So I'm very glad that Afghanistan meet all three of them. This is not all what I am saying. This has been endorsed by the local donor group and by the international community. After meeting all these three conditions, Afghanistan was granted with the membership for the Global Partnership for Education. Of course, this will be a window of opportunity from which we will get financial support. But this is another window of opportunity that we will learn from each other experiences. We will learn from each other best practices. We can contribute our best practices to the rest of the world. This membership has endorsed the capacity of the Afghan education system to deliver on the Millennium Development Goal 2 and Education for All Goal and has provided it with an additional opportunity to undertake further reform in the education sector, particularly in relation to access, equity, and quality. The program targets 55 districts in 13 provinces with lower education indicators. We will focus on those 55 districts where the education indicators are located at the lowest level, particularly in relation to gender parity, equity, and universal access. In this context, we have made the most deprived children, especially girls, in the most remote and less secure part of Afghanistan, our top priority for this program. Under GPE, we, we propose to introduce a set of four carefully designed program priorities with community and social mobilization at the heart of its strategic focus, targeted at expanding and reinforcing multiple pathways to education, namely community-based education, accelerated learning program, mass-based education, reopening of the school, and deploying qualified female teacher in the area where the need is most critical. Second, Kabul process. The Kabul process marks the beginning of Afghan-owned and Afghan-led governance process. This is well articulated in the Afghan National Development Strategy, which has been the basis for the formulation of National Education Strategic Plan and National Education Interim Plan, which is a three years plan, and education-related national priority programs, which is education for all and sustainable 
decent work through skill development, which ought to be submitted to the world community and Tokyo Conference for their support. Under the Sustainable Decent Work through Skill Development Program, we intend to create an environment for job recruit and provide informal, informal technical and vocational education and training. This national priority program will enable us to provide technical and vocational education to 200,000 young people. Third one is establishing open schooling system. While we are making every effort to make the Millennium Development Goal 2 of universal primary education through a formal education system, there are many challenges that need to be addressed, such as poor school infrastructure, shortage of qualified and trained teachers, especially female, the presence of a sizable percentage of nomadic population, and security concern in remote and far-flung areas. With a view to addressing the above-mentioned constraint, ladies and gentlemen, we propose to establish an open schooling system in Afghanistan <coughs> which would supplement the formal schooling system and help us in overcoming, to some extent, the social, economical, infrastructure, manpower, and accessibility constraint in the education sector by providing an open distance learning pathway to the target group, group to, uh, to gain their qualification, including vocational skill. Open schooling will provide them with greater degree of flexibility in pursuing their education. It will also enable them to pursue education at their own pace, to have their prior learning duly assessed and certified, and to pursue education while still contributing to their family livelihood. Open schooling would also cater to the special need of differently abled and children from disadvantaged section of the society. Fourth is transition. Respected colleagues, our progress in transitioning responsibility from the parallel structure which was created by international organization and bringing them the resources aligned under our own priority is of course a challenge that we will have to bring further reform. But at the end of the day, the resources available will be used according to our own priority in our own needs. Fifth one, special focus on the three provinces of Central Highland. We have launched a special program to address the education need of three provinces of Central Highland, Ghor, Daikundi, and Bamiyan. Again, we are the education indicators or lower by constructing 100 schools with the Japanese support and the financial management of UNICEF. Six, public private partnership. Colleagues, for the first time in Afghanistan, private sector has invested in general vocational and technical education. Today, around 500 private schools cater for nearly 300,000 students. We will build on this opportunity to strengthen public-private partnership and expand opportunities for operation of much needed technician for mine extraction, agriculture development, railway and other infrastructure sector that are essential to economic growth of Afghanistan. Now coming to the Norway's contribution. Education development, my colleague, has been one of the most successful legacy of the world community and of the world partnership with the Afghan people. And I am proud to state that Norwegian people and government have played a key role in this success. We acknowledge with gratitude the effort of the, uh, the government of Norway for aligning their development assistance with our national priority as stipulated in our national development framework in Afghanistan National Development Strategy. Norway has been one of the first contributor to the Afghanistan Reconstruction <coughs> Trust Fund and has provided us with a flexible support which cater to our national priorities. I also <coughs> deeply appreciate the generous cooperation of Norway and our most reliable partner in building the institutional capacity of the Ministry of Education for the development and implementation of National Education Strategic Plan 1 and 2 and the National Education Interim Plan. We understand that Afghanistan is the second largest recipient of the Norwegian Development Assistance, which amount to around US dollar 125 million during the last five years. The Norwegian aid has been primarily focused on basic education, technical and vocational education, 
educational planning and construction of school. Norway has committed to support our joint ambition to make Faryab one of the northern provinces of Afghanistan, the first province where all schools will have their own building in adequate number of qualified teachers. Norway has so far funded the construction of 155 schools, out of which 124 have been handed over for use, 22 are under construction, and 10 are taking it is procurement process. While we recognize that Faryab has remained a priority province for Norway, we also understand that your commitment and support would not be limited to that province alone, and some part of your support will also support our national priorities. Respected colleagues, as I speak before you, many Norwegian uniformed men and women are risking their lives to build a better and more secure future for our children by fighting insurgency and training Afghan security forces. In Faria province, where the Norwegian Provincial Reconstruction Team is located, considerable effort have gone into strengthening the local infrastructure, which has benefited hundreds of thousands of Afghan women and men and children on behalf of all of them, primarily the student. I wholeheartedly thank the Royal Norwegian Government and people. I am sure you will agree with me that unless we invest in our future, we shall not be able to sustain and build upon our achievement. Education in Afghanistan provides a formidable success story. Let's jointly capitalize on it for a better Afghanistan and for a better world. I sincerely urge the government of Norway to increase its support to Afghanistan in the field of education in the coming years, targeting educational infrastructure, teacher education, and adult literacy. As someone who has had first-hand experiences of how vulnerable and illiterate and less educated population is against exploitation, I call upon all of you and upon the world community to invest more in education in order to prevent debilitating human calamity of tomorrow that could never become irreversible. In my view, it is not the shortage of war machine that the world is suffering from, but the lack of equitable access to a useful and meaningful education that is making all us vulnerable to violence and destruction. Honorable friend, we remain committed to transforming education into a force of peace and prosperity and stability. I thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much for uh, this tour de force. And thank you in particular for ending with a very appropriate comment on the uh, relationship between education and peace. We do know that there is a close relationship, and I'm sure we'll return to that in uh, the debate. I think you laid a very good uh, basis for uh, questions. We have uh, a solid overview over what, as you very correctly pointed out at the beginning of your talk, has been one of the major success stories over the past decade, namely the rebuilding of the Afghan education system. But you also present us to some of the challenges, and you uh, give us access to uh, many of the initiatives that you are currently taking in order to uh, deal with those challenges. So I think there is plenty here to bite uh, into. Um, is there anybody in the audience who wants to kick us off? Please, and uh, may I ask you to please introduce yourselves. And since we are filming, it would be very nice if you could also talk with a microphone. Uh, Halvor here will be uh, bringing the microphone as you ask for the floor. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I've been to Afghanistan several times. My name is Jan Alexo. I'm from Nordic Consulting Group. And I've had the pleasure of visiting many of your schools in different provinces, literacy centers, community-based school centers, and indeed also vocational and training centers. So that has been a most joyful experience. Um, I'm going uh, very shortly on a Danida uh, mission, uh, visiting your ministry. 
and to take the education uh, support program to Afghanistan, the Danish uh, support uh, program, to the second round. Um, and I noticed a couple of things that you, you mentioned, so I have two questions. One, you talked about the reopening of schools and the success of that, that you had managed to open 500 schools in insecure areas. I wonder, uh, did you have to, to change the curriculum, to change the program, uh, or do any other types of changes in order to accomplish that? Uh, secondly, you mentioned that there are many parallel uh, projects and programs within your ministry. And I wonder uh, was, um, if you could elaborate a little bit more about the coordination challenges that you presently face in, in your ministry. Thank you. Well, uh, Johanna, thank you very much for uh, these two very, very important questions, and uh, warm welcome to you when you come to Afghanistan. <coughs> Please let us know. We will be just facilitating your, your visit, and rest assured, I will not be showing you any fabricated program. Uh, you will have your own choice to go anywhere, but I will be just facilitating your visit. With regards to the two questions, reopening of about 500 or well above 500 schools, inshallah, <coughs> this year, in the one or two more months, you will hear the news that hundreds of others will also be reopened. Madam, in my speech, I, I mentioned one thing, that when I used to be a young officer working with these gentlemen and gentlewomen, for anything we would ask, let's say for increasing our salary as, as a refugee officer, and the answer we would, we would get from, from the Swede, from the Norwegian, from the Danish, said, is this sustainable? So for anything that we would like, sustainability would be the word that would be on the tongue of everybody. We have learned good lessons from our working with the international community. And one of the lessons that has been evidently proved in Afghanistan and affirmed in Afghanistan, that no developmental intervention will be sustainable unless and until it is owned by the local people. Now, if there is one word that I can tell you that how we were able to reopen the school is community ownership. I have not used any bullet. I have not asked any police. I have not asked any soldier, any NATO, any ISA. What we did, we informed the community, we educated the community, we mobilized community, and we organized community. Around each one of the 15,600 schools, there is a committee called School Management Committee. And that consists of the student representative, parent representative, teacher representative, other representative body. When they go to the people who are behind closing the school, and they ask them that, why you are not allowing my girl to go to school? What is, uh, uh, madam, the, the answer you are expecting? When the entire community goes for something, there is only one answer, that is yes. Otherwise, if the community stand against them, you are no more there. So if anybody would be appreciated for this, nothing has, no compromise has been made. Once you made, you made a way to compromise, then there are thousands and thousands of compromises to come. Because there are different parts of Afghanistan, different parts of Afghanistan have different wishes. No compromise. And you are more than welcome to come. And I would be very happy if you tell me, if you indicate one school to me, that one subject, one title of my curriculum has been changed. It is a, a, a curriculum which is based on the realities of Afghanistan, which is based on the, the best practices of Afghanistan. There is no need, madam, for changing the curriculum. Rather, the attitude of the people have been changed. Community have been on our side. So this was the, the first one. And the second one is parallel structure. Yes, madam, till last year, there have been a lot of parallel structure, a lot. I will tell you just two of them. UNESCO was organizing electricity program supported by, by Japan. I think it is about 30 million, 30 million or 34 million dollar program. And that they were supposed to literate 600,000 people, okay? And of course, two years back, I began this 
the reduction of the parallel structure and bringing everything under the national priority of Afghanistan. If anybody is there, they want to support Afghanistan, they should strengthen my institution. I may not be there tomorrow, but my institution will be there. Any support which is for the Afghan people should be through us. Anything which is not through us, that is not for Afghanistan. So this is the slogan. There must be coordination and there must be cooperation. Without coordination and cooperation, going people on their own way, that is not going to support Afghanistan. What happened? 80% of the fund was spent by UNESCO, but 20% of the target was met. You see the efficiency. And there were a number of uh, teacher training programs supported by USAID and by others. We have asked every one of them and politely asked them, and they were convinced that they would all bring their program under our, uh, our priority. So from, from this year, inshallah, from 2012, most of these parallel structures will come and they will work under our own national priority together with us. Javed Kunadi. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the nice uh, lecture, and uh, thanks to you that makes such uh, seminars uh, possible. But, uh, I'm uh, Javed Kohanedi, a master student of peace and conflict study at the University of Oslo. But, uh, as you uh, pointed, uh, the progress in education in Afghanistan, that's uh, very great, and that's one of the sectors that we have uh, witnessed uh, progress. But uh, building uh, schools and uh, seeing students uh, uh, going to schools does not say anything about the quality of education. As in Afghanistan, we have been witness that uh, being a teacher is the most lower status uh, uh, occupation. And uh, students who failed uh, the concourse exam to enter a university, uh, often those became the teachers. So how can we expect a better students, a better uh, and, uh, qualified uh, students in the future workers when the teachers themselves are those who have failed to enter university was not qualified uh, of being a teacher. What kind of measurements uh, have you taken to improve uh, uh, the status of uh, teachers and uh, their quality? Thank you. Thank you, Joe John. This is a very, very important question. Quality, I fully agree with you that uh, I think in my speech, you, you, you have clearly uh, heard that I was not satisfied with the quality so far. But some of the constraints that you have referred to, that those people who would secure minimum mark in the concrete examination, those who could not go to other higher education institution will come to the teacher training colleges. And those people who could not find job elsewhere, they would come and become teacher. But my <coughs> friend, Joe John, the situation is absolutely changed now. There was one reason I will tell you, I, I, I believe you are an Afghan. There, there was one reason which you would know better than I know. Ma'alimin, teachers, and the civil servant, they were two different categories. A civil servant would have two advantages. If they would work in a higher rank, then their, their own, uh, their own uh, 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 Rutu, great, then he would be paid according to the position he or she acquired. Or if their grade were higher, but the position was lower, then he or she would be paid according to the, their own grade. What happened last year? There is one civil servant law. Civil servant and, and teacher are exactly deal with the same way. So there is no more differentiation. Why a civil servant, when there is similar privileges, why he would leave his job and become a teacher, or vice versa? This is one thing. The second thing was a systematic problem in our concrete examination. It was a blind examination. Suppose there would be 150,000 going through one exam, and a young lady from Badakhshan, from the far east of Afghanistan, would be admitted in a teacher training colleges in the far west of Afghanistan. Now, take my Afghan colleague, our culture into account. 
would you allow your young sister to go alone and edu be educated there? It was extremely difficult. What I did, in every province of Afghanistan, I have established a teacher training college. So no lady is required to leave her family for the sake of education, to get education in another province. One, I, I am not even satisfied with that. In every district of Afghanistan, the teacher were, for the time being on my, my payroll, you are either graduate of grade 6 or grade 9 or at the most grade 12. They are teachers. But in the meantime, through in-service program, within the satellite district level, teacher training college, part-time she is teaching as a teacher, part-time she is studying as a student in the teacher training college. So this is the way that we'll, I will upgrade the level of the teacher. And the, the pay and grading system for entire civil servant of Afghanistan, including the teacher, is the same and unified. So that is no more there that the lower quality people will choose to go to teach, to be teacher and the higher uh, quality people will go for other civil servants. That is no more there, my friend. Thank you. We have several names on the list, so let's take two uh, questions in a row, please. Det kan du gjøre. Ja. Kunne vi få, er det noen som uh, tilbyr seg å oversette, da, så er det fint. Da, hvis noen vil, da folk kan uh, kort uh, sette det og oversette for andre, eller jeg kan si på norsk etterpå. Uh, navnet meg, Bande Khodai Badullah. Ma معلمی متقاید هستم با سابقه کار در اکادمی تربیه معلمین در کابل و دارالمعلمین مزار شریف و تدریس در مکاتب نروژی در سالهای اخیر ما با یک توضیح مختصر بعدا با یک سوار و یک پیشنهاد خلاصه میکنم گفتم خوش ما از سال 2002 به بعد همه ساله به افغانستان رفتیم و کم یا زیاد در حدود امکانات محدودی که داشتم در خدمت معارف قرار گرفتیم اما در چند سال اخیر یک معانی بزرگ مایوس کننده ای را که ما دیدم که در اونجا توجه زیاد متاسفانه برش نشد او را به شما وظیفت وزیر معارف و پدر اولادهای معارف افغانستان یادواری میکنم امید است که یک رای حل پیدا کنه این زهرپاشی مکاتب نسوان است که اولین حادثه در منطقه خود ما در مکتب نسوان لسه نسوان ناهید شهید در سال 2007 صورت گرفت که 105 شاگرد مسموم شد سال 2011 یکی از شاگردها در اثر تکلیف اعصاب خودکشی کرد و هنوز اکتیاد دیگه هم رنگ می برند یک اما تا جایی که ما در چند سال بعد تحقیق کردم هیچ گونه تحقیق طبی صحی یا امنیتی حقوقی در این مورد صورت نگرفته و بعد از اون مکاتب دیگری و تازه در هفته یا هفته پیشتر هم یک مکتب دیگر در توسط فکر میکنم در ورسوالی رستاق در حدود 150 شاگرد دی دختر مسموم شدن ما فکر میکنم که در برای جلوگیری از این کار باید جدی صورت بگیره این نه تنها اینا مسموم شدن اینا تخویف شدن فامیل ها در ترس وحشت زندگی میکنن با برای بسری کسایی که با مکتب و قدر زیاد معرفت و ضرورت چه احساس نمیکنن یک بهانه است که اولاد خود با مکتب روان کنن که ترس خوفیس بعد جدی در ایسا کاری شد و ویره ما از شما خواهش میکنم و وقتی که آقای کرزه محترم رئیس جمهوری ما یک تعداد اطفال را که متاسفانه مجرم عملیات تروریستی شدند 
با او محبت پدری که داشت عفا کرد و مقامات بسیار بلندت به در این مراسم سهم گرفتن اونا را با تحفه ها رها کردن روان کردن به همون جاهایی که باز شاید اینها را استفاده سو کرده به همون تر مراجع ببرن با تحایف اما ما از شما پرسان میکنم که همین مکاتبی که در دوران شما زرد پاشی شده شما وصیفت پدر و اولادها خودتان تنها بدون رئیس جمهور البته بدون وزراء بدون مقامات بزرگ امنیتی با یکی از این مکاتب رفتین تسلیت دادین مادر و پدر را روحیه بخشیدین تحایف برای ازیاد دادین و زیر تداوی و چیزها گرفتین و برای تداویش که دقل یک سی رومی کرده پا اینا حمله سرشان میه برشان شده باشد این سوالش بود در پشنهاد میه رای حل عزیز ما در سالهای که رفتین دو دفعه در روزهای عید قربان ما تصادفی در اونجا رسیدیم Excuse me, I, I apologize, but you'll, you'll have to get to your question now, because I have several other people on my list, and there are only a few minutes left. اونجا تبلیغ میشد و تبلیغی بود که دخترایتون در مکتب نمانین به ادبی محاف که فاحشه میشوند در کجا بودی ای در ورسوالی فرخار اول از ولایت فرخار از مسجد جامع که شروع شد که صدر مشین ما کوشکم خدا در ماز جمع عید فرخار برسانم که اونجا برسیدم بعد از 10 دقیقه باز اومدی ما همین مضمونی تایپ شدگی ولی که دخترایتون در مکتب نمانین که فاحشه میشه و زناتان از کار دفتری نمانیم که فایشه میشه به عدوی محاف در روزی، در روز خوشی، در روزی که کلمات زشت و چیز باید نباید گفته شود این حال آدرس را که برای شما میتونم همی کسایی که تبلیغ میکنن ملاها هستن که تربیه و تمرین شدن در پاکستان و اونجا آمدن آزادانه از کار استاده برچبه کماندان امنیه همه گرفته شده ولسوال حضور داشته اینا همگی گماشته های قانون هستن. اما از در قانون به قانون تجاوز میشه از قانون نا دفاع نمیکنه شما باید از مقامات امنیتی خواهش کنید و شما آقای رئیس جمهور که اینها از این اللهای مساجد یا خط بگیرن که دیگه راجی و مکتب نسوان راجی و دختر مکتب خواندن راجی به چیزا کلمه ای نمیگن که اجازه نیست قانون اجازه نمیده و اینا آزاد بیان نمیتن دیگه هم اگه پای ما بود که فقط خدا کنه که شما I will, if you could just sum up very briefly, I will also try to be brief in your answer. The question was my colleagues, those who don't speak Norwegian. The question was that there have been poisoning, particularly in the girls' schools, over the last couple of years. Even one of them in 2011 have suicided herself. And the enemies of Afghanistan are trying to threaten the people not to send their children to school. This was the observation. The question to me was, as a minister of education, have I ever visited any one of these schools? Have I, have I ever treated them? Have I ever given them uh, courage? Third question was, why the president of Afghanistan has pardoned some of those insurgents, which was in the young age, and he left them go home unpunished. And the, 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 the fourth part, he is saying that there are mullahs in some district, he called Farhar district of Tahar province in northern Afghanistan. Helda, you know that because you have been working there. There are mullahs talking to the people, don't send your daughter to school because they will become bad, bad people. Okay? Now, my answer, Ibadullah uh, Khan, my great country fellow, number one, your country is in the forefront of war against terrorism. You will agree with me. 
when there are people coming and they are exploding themselves in the mosque. The holy place where everybody comes for worship. Okay? That happened in the very province of Tahar. And uh, uh, Engineer Umar, the governor of Kunduz, was killed exactly in the, in the prayer time. Okay? So you and my country is in the forefront of fight against terrorism. They are all people who would threaten us. I have received, my friend, more than 1,000 threats, threat to death, more than 1,000. But what option do I have? There is only one option that I will continue. I will not let my enemy to succeed. I will continue. Otherwise, if I was, was afraid, more than 1,000 threats to death I received in person. So what you say, you are there. But my friend, listen to me. Through WHO, you are more than welcome to go to the site of WHO. WHO has taken the sample. They have sent it to Cairo. They have sent it to Europe. They have sent it to America. No zero percent of the poison were identified. My security forces, they have taken all what they were possible, including ISA. You and I may not trust my and your security forces, but you and I would, would trust our our eyes of NATO forces, eyes of NATO have taken samples. There was no poison. Third, my friend, this has happened, I believe, for five or six or ten times. I have not heard any one of them who, who died because of the poisoning. Any one of them. Fourth, in none of the cases, it, it has not happened that I didn't pay a visit to the school. The first one happened in Kapisa province in, in Hurere Jalali. I was the one to visit the school and I brought them to the hospital. And that very day, when they get poisoned, all of them were released from the hospital because it is a psychological effect. There is no biological effect. Psychologically, they are threatened. And biologically, when the doctors see there is nothing, they don't need treatment. All what they need is psychosocial treatment. No biological and chemical treatment. And coming to the president of Afghanistan, this is my responsibility. Anything, any, anywhere happened. And a colleague of mine <coughs> here, he is from Tahar province. This gentleman from Rostock. They could be the propaganda of the enemies of Afghanistan. Just to threaten people not to go to school. In reality, nothing happened. None is, none is killed. None has passed away because of that. So it could be a, psych a psychological war. It could be a psychological warfare. The president of Afghanistan, I think I should not speak on his behalf, but in your and my language, we have said that if he, the blood cannot be washed with blood, okay? If, if the enemies of Afghanistan are coming and they are killing my kid, and they are using my kid against me. So if I arrest them, I don't think I should, I should, I don't think I should make myself a terrorist. This is terrorist job who kill people mercilessly. But I and you and my president and every other Afghan and every other human being, we should have mercy. We should have mercy for the people. If they were young people, they were misleaded, they were misguided, they were misused, they were poisoned. You know, they were brain drained. So we arrested them. I don't think they are the, all, the only one way was to kill them. Okay? I think this was also the way to, to give them to their parents. That please be careful. These are your children. Don't give them to the terrorists. To train them as terrorists. I don't think President Karzai has done a bad thing. I think <coughs> this is the way the human being should do it. So, uh, 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 I have a lot of interest and I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time. So uh, what we will now do uh, is the following. We take three more questions 
Those questions will have to be short, so those of you accept to take the microphone, at the same time sign a contract to formulate a clear and succinct question within 30 seconds, so that we can give the minister time to uh, respond. I'm sorry, we simply don't have time to expand the list beyond the three names that I currently have. And if that can be any comfort, I've also excluded myself from the list. I've been at it from the very beginning. <laughs> so, please, my friend from the Pakistani Embassy. My name is Naim Sabir Khan. I am from Pakistan Embassy. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency, for uh, uh, giving us the presentation on the education system in Pakistan. And we fully support the people of Pakistan and the government of Pakistan fully support your efforts. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, one small comment and one question. The comment is that we uh, are in the last three decades we, uh, in Pakistani uh, system, 28,000 uh, Afghan students have passed through the college and university. 6,000 are currently enrolled in the higher education uh, of Pakistani uh, sis, uh, institutes. And in next four years, 2,000 more fully funded scholarships are available to the students of Afghanistan. Uh, the comment is, how do you see uh, past 2014 when the international forces will draw down from Afghanistan? Will there be any funding problem which you foresee in the future that once they uh, glare will be away from the camera glare or other glare will be away will they will be stick it will not happen the, like last time that they left and they the funding dried down again Thank you. okay and then it yes you <laughs> uh, welcome to Norway my name is Hamid uh, I studied in Afghanistan so I know the system and I thanks for people on the teachers everybody there but I got three short questions first is uh, there are rumors saying that Farsi is going to be written as a second language in Afghanistan for the next curriculum, as well as the civil war history would be deleted from the curriculum. And the third is, I'm not familiar if any madrasa they are included in the education partner system of Afghanistan or not. If it is, what do they have any clue regarding the curriculum being taught in the madrasas or not? The third question I didn't get. I mean, the madrasa. Uh, I mean, madrasas where people are studying uh, religious ideas and religious uh, schools there. Is it part of the education minister or not? All right. If it is, do they have any control regarding the curriculum, curriculum. there or okay. not? The last question goes to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Yahya Najafizada, one of uh, the Afghan diaspora in Norway. My question is almost uh, uh, might be the same like uh, my Pakistani friend. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, from Minister that uh, I got uh, really a hope from your speech uh, that by 2020 maybe the rate of the illiteracy will almost go to zero in Afghanistan. Inshallah. Uh, inshallah. Uh, but uh, I have a question. Do you have uh, any exact commitments from the international society or, or exact exact countries to, to help you to, to get succeed in, in this plan in Afghanistan? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you and I'll, as, as you answer these questions, that will also have to be your final statement. I'm sorry we have so short time this afternoon. Okay. But if you have any... The Afghan refugees. I am personally graduated from the Punjab University. And there are many Afghans who have studied in Pakistan, but they are doing good job. So we are very thankful to the people of Pakistan. Okay? Uh, and we are two neighbors. And uh, two neighbors, if one is in trouble, the other cannot remain out of trouble. So I think this is the requirement of neighborhood. God forbid, if some bad days come to you, we will do even more than what you did for us. So I think this is what the neighborhood would, would require. The 2000 scholarship, yes, I am utilizing it. There are so many Afghans who educated, so I have no wording to thank the people of Pakistan for accepting us as their brother, okay? Uh, beyond 2014, yes, the international community will solidly stand be behind us. From Norway, we have a commitment. The foreign minister of Norway, I mean, I'm just giving you an example. The foreign minister of Norway will be visiting Afghanistan in six weeks. He will come with this message. I have the same message from Denmark. I have the same message from, from Sweden, from, from, uh, from Germany, from Canada, and from so many other people. The world is not going to abandon Afghanistan as far as uh, developmental work is concerned. We are strongly believe in that. But on the other hand, my friend, 
Naim Khan, I will be training skilled people. This is my sole responsibility. Afghanistan is not a poor country. This is going to be one of the richest country of the world. If we can extract our own natural resources, we have not been allowed. We have everything, but we did not have education. Bear it with me. If we are educated, and if we find our way to extract our own mineral resources, we will not be a poor country. We will not only be self-sufficient, but we will be supporting other nations who are in need. So, from the one side, world is with us. On the other side, with the passage of every day, our institution are standing on their own foot. And once we are capable to, to have the required level of skilled people to extract our own resources, they will pay off. Probably you will not need any support from our, our country. We will be self-sufficient. Thank you. My brother, Hamid, you're there. Thank you very much for your question. The question was that you have heard the rumors that Farsi or Dari is considered a second language. Going to be written in the cover of the next story column. That's fine. And you have also said that the history of the last 30 years have been excluded from the curriculum. Rumor said that will be. Rumor said that. And the third question is whether there is there is a formal curriculum for the madrasas. If they belong to us, whether the whether we have curriculum for them or not. Number one, my friend, Afghanistan constitution says there are two national languages. One is Pashto and one is Dari. In addition to that, there are eight minority formal languages. They are the Formal language in the area of your spoken. Am I correct? You agree with me? Now, in the Pashtun dominated area, which one is the first language? Well, considering the official speaking language, that's for C again. No, and you're, you're wrong. <laughs> there are two national languages. I wrote the Constitution of Afghanistan, just for your information. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the Constitution of Afghanistan. <laughs> I, you listen to me. For the, Pash, for the Pashto books, a book which is written in Pashto, of course that is the first language. Second language is Dari. A book which is written in Dari, Dari is the first language. Pashto is the second language. So that is, that is the balance. A book, again I am repeating, a book which is in Pashto, of course it is the first language. Dari is the second language. A book which is written in Dari, Dari is the first language. Pashto is the second language. No, let's, let's, no, let's have no argument. Listen to me and that's it. Uh, and as it is in Afghanistan. Sorry? As it is in Afghanistan that we should just listen and do nothing. But we are not, we are not, arg we are not arguing. You have an an your answer question, now I am answering it. You may not agree with me, but this is the answer. Let me come to the, to the, to the 30 years uh, history of Afghanistan. A, it has never been part of the history. So I have not excluded anything, anything. The framework for the curriculum of Afghanistan was made in 2002. I was not the minister, but with the world specialist, okay? Now we are writing the book one after another exactly according to the framework which was made in 2002. Okay? At that time, Mr. Kanuni was Minister of uh, Education, but I fully agree with that. I am not in disagreement with that. I fully agree with that. Now, my own argument, there could be people who want the 30 years last history to be included in the history book. We have no problem with that. The minister, we are just employee. The owner of the curriculum is the nation. If the nation want the curriculum of the last 30 years to be included in the book, why not by all means? The minister, whomever is the minister, we are just teaching the history. We are not writing the history. Writer of the history and teacher of the history, they are two different things. If the nation want that the, the history of the last 30 years can be included, they are more than welcome to establish a committee, a non-controversial committee, to write the history, and they will order the Minister of Education, whomever that can be, 
Okay, Minister of Education, teach it. We will be obliged to teach it. But for the time being, you may not show me any book which is written by any historian about the last 30 years. If you can prove that, I will be more than happy to, to, to see it. But I have not seen any book encompassing the last 30 years. I need, as a minister and the Ministry of Education, need a reference to which we make a reference. Where is the reference? There is no reference. But there are international arguments, my friend Hamid John, that many, many countries. According to the UNESCO definition, history is something over which 50 years is over. The current 50 year, year is called, they can be called a political process. You and I, we are in the political process. You and I, we are not in the history. So UNESCO says the history can be written over which 50 years are passed. During the 50 years, they, they can go to our ship. Then when other people come who are not part of this political process, they will write a history. Uh, Yahya John, I think you have the exact comment as my other colleague. So hopefully you got the answer. Or you want me to repeat it? Well, uh, just, uh, I was wondering if the international society uh, will draw their troops to Afghanistan, uh, how, how the security uh, will, will be together with, with their commitments, their, their civil commitments against Yeah, here, John. What you and I have learned the lesson from the Russia. The Russian, when they have left Afghanistan, there was a civil war. The world which is today in Afghanistan, I cannot even think that they will be leaving or abandoning Afghanistan, that soon after their withdrawal, Afghanistan will go back or slide back to the civil war. I don't think the world is wanting that. I don't think you and I want that. I think the withdrawal will be gradual, the withdrawal will be with common understanding, and the withdrawal will be with mutual understanding. So I am not afraid that Changes anyway coming. In 2014, change is coming. But this will be up to us. If we engineer the change, if we architect the change, the change will take us to our ultimate goal. But if we leave ourselves in the hand of the change, the change may take us anywhere. So this is up to us, that we have to engineer the change the way we want it. Thank you. That will be the last question of the day and also the last comment of the day. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for uh, taking your time and sharing your thoughts on uh, one of the most important issues uh, to Afghanistan right now and in the years ahead, namely the question of education. I don't think this discussion leaves any doubt that this is a critical issue, an issue where a lot has been achieved, where, but where there are uh, further challenges to be met. Uh, and I'm sure also that our debate on education will uh, continue. Uh, here at the Peace Research Institute, we are certainly interested in uh, a number of aspects of education, many of which we have touched upon today. I wish we had a full day in which we could discuss these issues and uh, lay out the whole agenda, but uh, we have nonetheless, despite the short time, been able to touch on many of the critical questions, and it's been very... Uh, uh, very uh, entertaining. It has been a great learning experience to have you here, Your Excellency. Thank you also to the audience. Thank you to each and every one of you who posed uh, well-informed uh, questions. Thank you to everybody for being here. And uh, you're welcome back for new seminars here at uh, PRIO on Afghanistan, but also on other parts of the world, on education, but also on other issues. And you, Minister, are certainly welcome back any time where you want to share your thoughts or where you need simply a place to withdraw and think. So you're always welcome, dear friend. Well, my dear friend, Christian Burke, first of all, and once again, I thank you very much from the core of my heart for arranging this opportunity to see so many friends, scholars from my country, Afghanistan, and from Norway and from other countries. This was one of the best opportunity that I wanted to use it, so I thank you very much. I thank you all, those who have questioned, and I'm extremely sorry for those. You have not 
receive the chance to, to ask me questions. But I am available here today and tomorrow. Tomorrow this time I will be leaving and I am located in the Grand Hotel. If any one of you want to have further talk with me, you are more than welcome. I appreciate every question, whether from whatever intention it was, I appreciate it. I thank you very much. Thank you.